Lawrence, thanks for taking some time to join me on the show. It's a pleasure, Owen. Thanks for having me. I flew up to Sydney. I got the call yesterday from the Australian Shareholders Association, who is the, the biggest organization uh, in Australia for representing retail or smaller shareholders. And they said you were available this morning to chat. And I thought, I have to get to Sydney, come up, and it's my delight to have you with me. So thanks for thanks for joining me. It's a pleasure. I'm, I'm really enjoying Sydney. Thanks for flying over. <laughs> I, um, I do have a few, uh, I guess, important questions to get to, but... Here in Australia, there's a bit of a rivalry between states. I'm a Melbourneian or Victorian. And I was just wondering if you might be so inclined to tell us what is your, your favorite place in Australia, your favorite city, or if maybe you just tell us a little bit about Australia, what you like so much. I love them all. The, you know, the, a question like this, it's such a hard question, Owen, because it's a, it's a little like, which of your children are your favorite <laughs> children? You know, I, I try to avoid that, but because they're, but each one is distinctive and, and has its its special appeal. I, I do love Sydney. It's so naturally beautiful. The the water everywhere. Mm-hmm. The architecture is spectacular. Uh, Melbourne, of course, the best place for coffee in the world. Mm-hmm. I'm a big, big coffee drinker. Um, Queensland has perhaps the best beaches in the world. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Sydney has cool beaches, too. We Absolutely. just went up to Manly yesterday. And the Northern Territory is so picturesque. So, yeah. um, and Tasmania. Uh, great wines and cheeses. So you, you really you really got it all. Uh, it's it's a it's a very blessed country uh, <laughs> continent, and, and we're just the other thing. It's huge, and so we're here in Sydney for a couple of weeks. We'll, we'll go up to the um, Great Barrier Reef and visit Hamilton Island, um, but we'll have to come back many times. Yeah. So for those of you that aren't watching, I did hand Larry uh, a guide to Australia, and of course Melbourne's at the top of the list, <laughs> uh, which will be contentious for I know for some of the Sydney siders. But mate, to kick things off, I've got some short answer questions. You know, you're a professor. You would you would like the test. It's my turn to test you, perhaps. Uh, and these questions, I'm just looking for like kind of those system one thinking responses. And I, I, I'm intrigued by this because you work with so many talented investors, managers, so on and so forth. But who is the most unassuming investor that you have met? Chris Davis. Chris is the third generation of the Davis investing dynasty he he runs the the davis select advisors um but you wanted just a quick answer not a not a paragraph look him up chris davis i can see that on the sheet in front of you there yeah the slide there okay um okay the second question is what's one thing you do because you've written so many books we will have all the links in the show notes including this one here margin of trust which you might hold up to the camera for us i this is the first time i've seen this book so there'll be a link in the show notes to purchase this but what's one thing that you do to write more effectively? I cross out a lot of words, sentences, and paragraphs. I think the biggest problem in writing is people overwrite, and then they think every word, mm. paragraph, and sentence is beautiful. They're not. So I discipline myself to cross out at least 20% of what I wrote. Well, wow, so do you do that immediately, or do you, do you wait and read it back? Or? Read it back, yeah. After, after it's, it's, it's nearly done, I, I, the penultimate version, I feel like this is presentable, digestible, understanding, understandable, interesting, and then I cut 20% more. Wow, that's great. <laughs> it takes a lot of discipline. but And the, the strategic maneuver I do is I, I save those excised portions to a separate file. I okay. call it the junk file for whatever that project is. So it's a little easier to excise that way because yes. you're not, uh, you know, putting it into the ether. You're putting it into the cloud. You know, you're, you've, you've got to get it copy. again yep. if you feel you need it. So it, it makes it a little easier to do. Yep. Okay. So I've got uh, a question here, which is more so. I think this may be something that touches on the Charlie Munger multidisciplinary learning type uh, angle, which is. Imagine you are 18 again and you have to go and study your undergraduate degree and you there's only one thing you want to do. You want to be a professional investor. So which of these, I guess, courses of study or degrees would you choose to pursue? Arts, engineering, law or commerce? If I had to choose one, Owen, I'd, I'd choose commerce. It's the most immediately relevant and it provides good context. But I'd prefer to choose from all of them and if I had to take a degree and commerce, or, um, I'd, I'd nevertheless want to take courses from those other areas. I mean, a, mm. a, a, a nice joke that I like to share is I think every economist ought to study literature and every uh, linguist ought to study economics. I, I just, 
you need a broad base. You hit it right on the head. Charlie Munger is famous for emphasizing the multidisciplinary approach. He calls it the lattice work. So if you know the core ideas in a large number of subjects, you're more capable of absorbing and understanding and conducting analysis. So I understand the temptation to specialize and the need for degree programs at universities, but to the extent that you can keep your your breadth uh, quite wide and your mind wide open, you'll, you'll be better off as an as an investor and mm. probably as a human being. Mm. Absolutely. We have uh, here in Australia, we have a lot of our undergraduate degrees can be double degrees. Take instead of three or four years, they take five and you get more of that kind of like you, you may specialize, you may come out as an engineer, but you may have doubled it up with arts or commerce or something like that, which is a which is a great uh, way to do it. Um, so we're going to talk about writing, about books, shareholder advocacy, about quality shareholders, management and investing. But I really wanted to start off with you specifically. And I'm hoping you, there's something that I read and I don't know if this is true. So feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, but I heard that you put yourself through high school or what we would call high school. And you had this, it seemed like you had this yearning for learning. Um, can you talk to us about that? And I'm really interested where the fascination for business or, or corporate America came from. Sure, thanks so. And uh, my dad died when I was young and we had a big family and my mother had to struggle to make ends meet and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And I ended up, uh, for high school, for secondary school, um, that is from when I was 14 to 18 years old, at a school called Gerard College. And that word college is misleading to an Engl Anglo audience because it's a the French word for secondary school. Mm -hmm. And it was founded by a Frenchman named Stephen Gerard, who was the richest man of his time. He hmm. um, died in 1830 and with a massive fortune that would be the equivalent of a Warren Buffett or Rupert Murdoch or Bill Gates today. And Stephen Gerard left his entire estate to the founding and uh, permanent endowment of this school, wow. Gerard College, which was for poor. These are the words he used in his will. They've all been modified over the years, but in 1830, it was for poor white male orphans. And I was one of them. And, and he spelled out in elaborate detail the curriculum and the course of learning, which was very practical. Um, he was a very practical man. He made his fortune uh, as a mariner, a trader, plying his ships from Bordeaux, France to New Orleans in the United States, mm -hmm. and then eventually Philadelphia, where he put this school. And he was a very practical man believed in science, believed in math, <laughs> believed in business and commerce. Um, just to give an example of the curriculum, he said, I would rather have them taught facts and things rather than words or signs. That's a direct quote. He's a very practical instead of abstract person. He said, I would rather have them taught French and Spanish rather than Latin or Greek. So again, very practical. Um, those languages, those dead languages, are Greek still alive, but very small population. They're not as practical. So I, I was extremely grateful for the education that his beneficence provided. It, it provided just deep formation for my development, for my appetite for learning and uh, in my orientation toward <laughs> practical ventures. Uh, and so it was really him as the role model and uh, his his own achievements. He too was a poor white male orphan. His dad, his both of his parents died. He was ten. Uh, he was a cabin boy first on these Paris ships, and eventually he saved his money, bought one ship, made more money, bought three ships, and hmm. then just built uh, this enormous fortune. He financed the America War of eighteen twelve against the British uh, single handedly. America would have lost that war. He, uh, Philadelphia was engulfed by a yellow fever epidemic. It was every, so it's a worse than COVID or right up there with COVID people dying and mm -hmm. obviously didn't have vaccines. And so the whole process of the yellow fever epidemic took longer and took more people, more deaths and people fled doctors, civic leaders fled Philadelphia. 
Stephen Gerard stayed there, nursed people back to health, opened a hospital. So he's just an amazing person. And I encourage people. He's he's one of those figures who's had enormous influence on a lot of individual lives and is is underappreciated in the broader historical narrative. So those mm. who are listening want to learn about a fascinating figure who was also a great businessman and investor, um, check Stephen Gerard out. Okay. And so you were fortunate then, it seems, to go to the school where there was a lot of practical learning, um, a lot of applied knowledge. Um, and it's clear just from that passage that you, you know, you're appreciative of that opportunity to do that. Uh, can you talk to us about how your journey began with, I guess, Warren Buffett's letters and Berkshire Hathaway and how you kind of, you took that opportunity to get to, to studying something like that and being so fascinated because so many people are fascinated with the letters and so many people are fascinated with Berkshire, but few go on to do what you did and study every letter, every interaction, write books about it. I first uh, encountered Warren Buffett and his letters in a law school class on corporate governance. And my professor, who became a friend of mine, um, had worked with Warren Buffett on a, on a securities law project about how to write in plain English. A lot of the disclosure, and I'm sure it's true here in Australia too, in, in, a, in a prospectus or an annual report is very legalistic, very formal, very hard to read. Warren and my professor, Elliot Weiss, were on a committee to write these documents in plain English so ordinary people could understand them. Warren is an exemplar of that approach. His letters, while tackling very difficult technical subjects, are understandable by an ordinary person who's not schooled in business. In Warren's secret, when he's writing, to give Warren's answer to an earlier question you asked about the secret to good writing, Warren imagines his audience is his sister, who has no business background, no technical proficiency in any of the subjects, accounting or finance or tax. So, but she's intelligent and he explained, that's his audience. And I think keeping that kind of audience in mind helps write with clarity. So I, Elliot introduced me to his letters. I was um, bewitched. I, I was blown away. Um, I, I found the material, it resonated with my own views on many subjects. Um, in, including the role of markets and the difference between market price and intrinsic value, the, the role of, of, of practical substantive analytics in, 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 in investing as opposed to some the, you know, the elegant batch of modern finance theory around CAPM and um, uh, the other tools, modern portfolio theory. And so and the material was clear and also resonated. So um, uh, I eventually had the idea that this would – I mean, one, one of the weaknesses or one of the difficulties of the letters is that he, he writes one every year. They get very long. They're perfect for that year. Um, but then as you accumulate the, the 60 years of them, that's this giant stack of you know, 2,000 pages that are in, in lots. If you just read through them all from beginning to end, there's a lot of redundancies. Um, there's a lot of technical detail that is not of great use to ordinary investors. And so I had the idea to rearrange them by topic rather than in by year and to remove the redundancies to feature the core principles. And um, I had that idea and I told my friends and they said, well, that's a really great idea. You know, how, how are you going to get Warren's permission? You know, what are you going to do? I said, well, I'm, I'm going to ask Elliot. Uh, <laughs> and so Elliot, Elliot asked, uh, and they were, they were not super close friends, but our Dean, the Dean of this, this school uh, was close friends with Warren's close friend, and so those two connected, presented it to Warren, and Warren called me, called me on the phone after I'd made the proposal through my dean and through his friend and said, Larry, this is Warren Buffett. I, I like your idea. Let's let's talk about the idea. And I, I thought it was someone pulling a <laughs> prank. Uh, <laughs> so who is this? Uh, but it was him. And I, you know, I think just a footnote to that, what, what, how did you asked me, how did I go about it? And that, that's how I went about it. The other interesting question is, why did he say okay? Because I mm. wasn't the only person who ever made this proposal. Um, and he said okay because of trust, that he trusted his colleague, who in turn trusted my dean, who in turn trusted my professor, who in turn trusted me. So it's this just circle of trust. 
that Warren knew that he could count on me treating the letters with the integrity and the respect that they deserve. And um, that's what we did. That's what we've done the whole the whole time is present the letters in their authentic uh, uh, shape and, and with their intended purpose, which for Warren was was to educate people. I, I can only imagine what it would be like to get that phone call. Uh, and to, maybe it's one of your friends who have a recording and was, was trying to trick you, but um, it wasn't the case. So the idea of quality shareholders, maybe if you can frame that for us just by explaining what that is for people that haven't come across it. And uh, obviously there'll be links in the show notes to anyone that wants to go into depth with some of your, your uh, writings on this. But can you talk to us about the genesis of that and then maybe we'll talk to more, I guess, the advantages of this process. I can see you've got the slide in front of you with some names on there, which we'll get to. But can you talk about like what is a quality shareholder in your opinion? Why was that so fascinating to you? Thanks, Owen. The concept of quality shareholders is due to Warren Buffett, who wrote about this idea in his 1978 letter to Berkshire shareholders. That's one of his earliest letters as a public company and it was a reference to his desire to attract only shareholders who would focus on Berkshire Hathaway and understand Berkshire Hathaway and who would commit to permanent ownership of that stock that he didn't really want um, arbitrageurs people who are trading in and out of the stock Mm. And he did, didn't want people who bought the stock without understanding Berkshire. And he called that cohort quality shareholders. And he succeeded. Berkshire has the, a great density of shareholders who are long-term and concentrated in Berkshire stock. Why I, came, why I came onto that concept was in 2014, when I published a book called Berkshire Beyond Buffett, it addressed the question on so many people's minds, what happens to Berkshire Hathaway after Warren Buffett leaves the scene? Mm. It's the classic succession question. And Warren had always said that Berkshire culture would see to the company's prosperity after he's gone. So that book was an attempt, but he didn't, he didn't elaborate what culture meant. So that book was an elaboration of that concept. And it focused on every constituent of the company, the board of directors, the managers of the operating subsidiaries, and the shareholders. And as I pushed that, the very specific idea of succession at Berkshire, the classic idea that who will be chairman after Warren's gone, and I figured that out, or they figured it out, and I figured it out, it's likely to be his son, Howard, because he's got the DNA, and he'll be able to continue that important job. The successor as CEO is very likely to be Greg Abel, the manager mm. of the big energy business who has proven adept at capital allocation and managerial leadership and, and commands the respect of all the other managers. Um, the successor as chief investment officer will be the two people who manage these sub portfolios, Todd Coombs and Ted Weschler, proven value investors with great discipline. Um, and that left the shareholder, that's the fourth role that Warren has played that needs a successor. Warren Buffett has been the controlling shareholder of Berkshire Hathaway for 60 years. No one will make a run at Berkshire Hathaway with him in that, in that mm -hmm. role. They, they occasionally uh, agitate for a dividend. Um, recently, uh, activist investors have promoted agendas around environmental and social causes, but Warren's role as controlling shareholders has been important to the company's success. What will happen to, Berk to Berkshire after Warren leaves? Well, his estate will hold his 30-ish percent, but that his estate, his instructions to his estate are to distribute that stock in about 12 even installments over 12 years by donating it to the Gates Foundation, which will then have to sell it and make donations to charity. So at year 12, the Buffets will own no stock. And so at some point during that 12 year period, there will be no controlling shareholder. And to me, I found that to be the weakness in the succession plan. That to me is the Achilles heel. 
In other words, I think the chairman job will be well ex executed. The CEO job will be well executed. The CIO job will be well executed. I'm very confident in that part of the plan. The shareholders, it will be up to the shareholders to determine the fate of Berkshire Hathaway after Warren leaves the scene. If that shareholder base remains high quality, remains a group of people who are long-term and focused on Berkshire, then the company will prosper post Warren Buffett. But if the shareholder base drifts to become indexed, that's owned by funds who don't pick stocks, but just happen to own Berkshire because it's in the index, or short-term, people who are trying to make arbitrage moves, short-term profits. If it, if it migrates to that kind of ownership, Berkshire will die. Mm -hmm. So that's why I focused on share, quality shareholders so much. Mm -hmm. And I, I wrote a whole book about it and, uh, and examined um, other companies who have attracted high quality high density of quality shareholders, identified who those quality shareholders are, and what they look for. And then I try to lay out um, the benefits of a, to a company of attracting large density of quality shareholders and also w why a person might want to be a quality mm -hmm. focused long-term investor. So thanks, Owen, for, for asking that question. Mm -hmm. I, I do think um, I found it to be a, a profound aspect of Warren's achievements at Berkshire to have had that shareholder base. And uh, it enabled me then to see how valuable that's been to many other wonderful companies uh, and how our the dynamics of contemporary share ownership are, are shifting that that uh, appetite that and the population. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's one of the most important topics of our um, of our era in terms of corporate administration. Mm. Obviously, uh, there are you know various ways for people to become involved in in company matters and to vote here in Australia through the Australian Shareholders Association. Folks can appoint the ASA as proxy and they can vote on their behalf. And there's a set criteria. It's available on the ASA website. A lot of people have taken this idea of quality shareholders, including here in Australia, Kelly Partners have, have done this too, and they've published publicly you know, I guess instructions or a guide to how they think about shareholders. And a common uh, review, something that I see commonly in reviews of quality shareholders book is that this is not just about the shareholders, this is about management, how they conduct themselves, how they conduct their businesses. And there's a quote that you had in an interview that you did a few years ago, which is, the best stock is one that's fairly priced. And I'm hoping that maybe you can elaborate on this in, in any way that you can. And, and I guess highlight the benefits for all stakeholders in, in this kind of triangle, like you've got management, you've got shareholders, and you've got, I guess, markets as well. Quality shareholders are the linchpin. And thanks for mentioning Kelly Partners Group, a, a wonderful Australian company. I'm on the board of directors, so mm. maybe maybe a little biased, but um, that, that company has consciously sought to cultivate a quality shareholder base and has used, I mean, I, I think the, the company believes in the in the principles that help to attract quality shareholders and has consciously um, executed uh, on those principles. And one of those tools is what you mentioned, an owner's manual is what uh, they call it. And Berkshire Hathaway has an owner's manual too. And it's a description of the menu that that company is offering. The, the, what the, those managers are telling the shareholders they can expect. Mm. And both of those at Berkshire and at Kelly emphasize thinking long-term that when these companies, Berkshire and Kelly, buy a business, they intend to hold it forever. That's very different from a lot of acquirers, especially in, in the financial mm. world of, say, private equity, where they're they're always thinking, what's our first exit? What What's our exit <laughs> strategy? Berkshire and Kelly have no exit strategy. They don't want one. And so they're telling the shareholders, that's how we're going to run this business. We're running it forever. We're, we're providing permanent capital to our, to our selling owners. We are providing a permanent home for those people. So shareholders, if you're going to join us, if you're going to invest in us, please share that time horizon. 
And, and so that's one example. There are, there are many prongs in those owner's manuals, but th that's exactly what they're, they're trying to do, trying to attract shareholders who, whose, whose own views um, gel with the company's views. And, mm. and that, that's, that's the essence of it. There's another joke that Warren used to say or a quip that eventually you get the shareholders you deserve. And, and so if mm. you are long term, you will get long term shareholders. If you emphasize the specific features of your business as a manager, you will attract shareholders who who get that, who appreciate that. And so both at Berkshire and at Kelly, their approach is disciplined capital allocation, providing autonomy to the managers of those businesses in a decentralized structure that's rooted in trust. And those those motifs tend to attract shareholders who prioritize and appreciate those things, the quality shareholders. So it is, as you say, a, a triangle or symbiotic, you know, the company's management and the managers, board of directors and the shareholders all, mm. um, uh, coalescing around a, a single set of simple values and, and they can vary. Berkshire and Kelly are different in lots of ways. Berkshire buys businesses in any industry and, um, doesn't really have a set of best practices across those industries. Whereas Kelly is focused uh, so far entirely on accounting and financial advice uh, and has developed an, an exquisite playbook of, of best practices on how best to organize and run uh, the, the, those offices within the accounting mm. um, business. So, so I think you're entirely right about that, Owen. And um, and people do do self select. Mm. It's a I, it's the uh, kind of like the rest, restaurant analogy is kind of like know who you're serving, and then over time, those you know, you have those repeat customers, right? And they come yes. back time I, and time again. That's that's a great one, especially for for our audience here. This restaurant analogy goes back to Phil Fisher. Mm. In, in his 1958 book, Common Stocks and Uncommon Profits. And, and he said, well, gee, if you think about it, companies offer a menu and shareholders can decide which menu they like. And his specific analogy was that you have five-star restaurants who attract gourmands, you know, the mm. fine eateries are attracting the, the really discerning uh, diner, whereas fast food uh, like McDonald's, um, is catching eaters on the run, people who are moving, not really uh, savoring the taste, but just gobbling it up. And his third example was the the buffet or the smorgasbord where um, every t sort of food is on offer and, and the diner is interested in just tasting a little bit of everything. And so if you, that analogy plays out in today's shareholder demographics where the quality shareholder is the gourmand, looking for a very high quality company looking to have a very long dinner, looking to be there late in the evening. Um, whereas the, the fast food is the transient, the trader, the arbitrageurs, look at, looking for a quick quick buck, looking to make money very quickly, buying low and selling high, and not really all that concerned with how it tastes, but just trying to get it done. And then hmm. the, the smorgasbord of the buffet would be the index funds that, that aren't discriminating at all across different tastes. They're, they buy a bit of everything based on a formula uh, according to the, the index they're in and the size of the companies within it. And they're, not, they're not tasting. Uh, they're really not savoring at all. They just have a bit of everything. So it's amazing, actually, Phil Fisher kind of laid out those mm. examples because they're exactly what we see today. Mm. I must admit, I do, I do like my food cheap and good, but my long-term investing, I prefer the high quality and I'm happy for it to be more expensive. You touched on a point there, which is passive investing. The rise of passive investing is a global theme that we see playing out now over decades. Um, and here in Australia, the biggest companies like Commonwealth Bank of Australia, BHP, massive companies have huge passive shareholders sitting on their register. And I was on the Vanguard website this morning, for example, just trying to navigate through by country, by business, and by year, the voting intentions and how they outsource that. And I think a lot of people that listen to this or watch this show don't know how that happens. And like, I guess what the, I guess the pros and the cons are of passive investing when it comes to corporate governance. So maybe if, if you don't mind just touching on that, and I guess, are you concerned about this from a company perspective, from a market's perspective? 
Thanks, Owen. Yes, it's a very important topic. And if you, I think the best way to think about it is you go back to the era of Phil Fisher in the 1950s, and even into the 60s. Um, and for a lot of the people listening on this program, we tend to focus on particular companies. Um, we have only a limited capacity to, you know, in terms of time and, and ability. So we we might uh, study BHP or Commonwealth Bank and Kelly Partners or Berkshire, um, and we'll focus very deeply on that company and really try to understand its business, its products, its customer base, its market, its capacity, its and then the cultural features like its time horizon, uh, how it treats its workers, and then think hard about um, the economic uh, features that would form a valuation estimate and then would make a judgment about whether that investment um, at its current price is, is attractive. It's a very old fashioned way of doing things and it's company by company. In 1970, um, the, the index fund was launched. That is the, a passive investment vehicle that buys a little bit of stock in every company in an index. So if you have the Standard & Poor's 500, for instance, and that's your, that's your index, that's your fund, Vanguard, a manager at Vanguard will say, we're going to have the Vanguard S&P 500. And they simply buy a fractional uh, position of every one of those 500 companies without paying attention to the details of any of them. Mm -hmm. they're, they're not interested in the details of any of them. They're interested solely in that market, that market return. It's a, an ingenious investment strategy because you don't have to do any work. You just buy the index and by the law, you're buying the market return, good or bad. It may be 9%, 11%, 7%. Last year it was negative 18%, but what, whatever it is, that's all you're getting. And that's what you want. And what's nice about that is it costs very little to do. The, the world of Phil Fisher examining Berkshire and Kelly and Broken Hill and Commonwealth uh, it takes a lot of time. It, you have to spend money to figure out the mm. valuation. The genius of the index fund is it doesn't cost anything uh, to pick the stocks. You have to pay somebody to do the computers and pick, you know, change the buy, buy and sell as the market valuation of these things rises and falls. But the effect of that was that those firms couldn't really afford to um, make individualized company by company decisions on topics like who should be on the board, what should the size of the board be, how many independent directors should there be, what committees should they have, um, what reporting structures do they need, what kinds of disclosures should they have. They couldn't afford to do that company by company. So those funds began to produce general guidelines, blueprints that says that say things like every company should have the following features. Every company should have a majority of directors independent, should have an audit committee staffed only by independent directors, should have a certain number of committees. They should meet a certain number of times. No director can be a director of more than four companies. A CEO cannot be a director of more than one other company. On and on. I mean, nowadays, it's things like no company should have a dual class capital structure. No company should have a cumulative voting ap approach to the election of directors. No company should have blank check preferred, that is authorized, but none issued class of preferred stock. Because they have to have these general blueprint rules because they can't afford to examine every single company. Mm. That's a byproduct of the otherwise brilliant concept of the index fund. They have to have these very generalized rules. And yes, I, I think it's concern. So that's a that's a big problem. What you're getting across the corporate landscape, I call it cookie cutter governance. It's one size fits all, if you like, mm. rather than a made to measure or a uh, bespoke uh, system. And I think that is problematic because in, in my observations, um, one size does not fit all. Um, you know, a current fashion among the uh, the indexing guidelines is that the CEO and the chair of the board have to be different people. That, that's a one of their rules. Mm. Well, the the evidence shows that that's not always a good idea. Sometimes it is. It's good to have 
different centers of power and checks and balances within the executive suite and boardroom. But sometimes a company's better off when those positions are held by the same person. Uh, it just so happened Warren Buffett is the chair and CEO. Brett Kelly is the chair and CEO. There are a lot of companies for which combining those roles is much more effective. And it, it, so there's no cookie cut. It depends on the personalities of those people and then the constitution of the rest of the board and the degree that that board has um, uh, the capacity to check the power of that that person, the the strength of, of the individuals on that board. And so you, in my view, the, the quality shareholders offer great value by being discerning and being able to make firm specific judgments on all of these governance topics, whereas the indexing community cannot do that. Um, they, they simply cannot, but as a matter of economics, they, their staffs are small, they have to be small, they can't, they, you can't deliver the market return with very low costs unless you have this one size fits all approach. But I, I think it's problematic um, and it's increasingly problematic because the index funds have become extremely popular, so much so that the big three, which includes Vanguard, as well as uh, State Street and BlackRock, have become so popular that so many people simply invest with them and are happy to get the market return at virtually no cost. Um, but the, the power that, that those funds have become extremely large and, and they own, at least in the United States, those three large index funds together will own some 20% of almost every large company. And such a sizable percentage means they they really can control the outcome of very many uh, governance votes. And th my concern is that that concentrates enormous power in a very small number of people in the civilization. So this, this gets beyond uh, corporate life and investing in, into the sort of the power distribution in society. And if, I may say, you mentioned Vanguard. It was founded, it's one of the first index funds. It was founded by Jack Bogle, who wrote his undergraduate dissertation on the index fund concept in, in 1954. And so he's seen as the founder of the index fund. And he, he certainly put Vanguard's leadership there and uh, was a very public minded person, delightful fellow. I knew him well. He wrote many books. I, I commend them all. Um, and so he's a very prolific, public-spirited fellow. And one of the last public acts uh, he took was to write an op-ed, you know, an opinion piece in the Wall Street Journal about eight months before he died, warning about the concentration, the enormous concentration of power in the index fund industry. The, the, you know, the, the, the industry that he essentially founded. He said, look, it's wonderful. I'm very glad I did it. But there is one problem that we're going, getting to, a, we will get to a point soon where, an, where a dozen people will, will control society. And I, I think his warning was that no matter who those people are, it's probably not a good idea. These concepts are really expanded uh, in the book. So this is, I think if you want to become a more discerning investor and um, I guess advocate for your company, uh, Read, read the books from Lawrence. Um, in particular, I'm going to call out um, the essays here is fantastic for any investor. Um, you know, quality shareholders. And you've got the original copy here, which I haven't seen. This is the Australian version, if you hold it up to the camera there. This is the Australian version with the red cover. My cover is, the, 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 I think it's black. Um, so fantastic book for anyone to pick up. Uh, it's probably one of the top five books I see recommended anywhere in the world for investors, which is fantastic. So kudos to you. Um, and obviously quality shareholders for management. But then this one here, can you use, because you brought this in today and I must admit, I didn't come, I hadn't come across this margin of trust. And this is about the business model. And the reason I bring this into the conversation, especially is because the model itself of Berkshire and many of the businesses that you have on your slide deck there um, uh, are very unique in that they, many of them seem like a, co a conglomerate star model. And they are oftentimes controlled by or not even controlled, but led by someone like a founder or someone like this that um, I guess is an icon for that business and people have that trust in that person. Like the buck stops with me here. Um, and I guess this is more like a, a general question about in these investors and management managers that you come across of these businesses in that 
what are some of the things that they do so differently? Maybe, and I frame this in the questions that I sent to you as like the common traits or uncommon traits of these people because Constellation software is very different to Berkshire. So I guess I'm trying to get at like the essence of what enables these people to rise to that point and produce these types of businesses. Well, it's an excellent question. And thanks for the kind words about the essays of Warren Buffett and Margin of Trust. And I'll link the two by emphasizing how we got the title of Margin of Trust. Mm. You, you may know um, that Warren Buffett says the three most important words in investing are margin of safety. And there he's referring to mm. a, a thick protection between the price that an investor pays for a stock or investment and, and the intrinsic value they have um, estimated they are getting. We all make mistakes. Uh, so, you, you know, you may be wrong in what you're actually getting. And he just said, look, the most important thing when you're investing in anything is give yourself some comfort around that possibility of a mistake. And he called it the margin of safety. When we, when we turn to write the a story about the Berkshire business model, the manager, the management of, of this or this very large organization. We discovered as we as we examined the the elements of the model, the relationships between the people, both uh, board to manager, manager to shareholders, a company buying a business and the sellers of that business, customers, employees, and other constituents. When we when we examined the operation of of Berkshire Hathaway and a dozen other companies, we saw that the the, the unifying feature was a margin of trust. Mm. What we mean is. I'll take Warren again. Warren says, I never go into business with anyone unless I trust them deeply. That, think about that and think about that in your own, your own situation. Um, he, he, at the whiff of doubt about someone's integrity, Warren walks away, whether it's a seller of a business, an executive, a, a potential investor. Um, and why is that? What we, it, because he, he is a man of integrity himself, and he thinks the best manager manages the least. So when he brings on a new business or hires a new CEO, he wants them to manage the business. He, he doesn't want the job of mm. second guessing and really even of overseeing. He wants to be able to say, uh, you're running this mining company, do the best you can. You're running this bank do the best you can. Let me know if there are problems. Let me know if I can help out. But I'm not going to conduct the geological, sur geological surveys or, or conduct the, the background checks. So he only wants to go into business with people that he trusts. And the other examples that you, that you describe are, are similar. And I think as you, when you invest and as you acquire companies and you grow your portfolio, you grow your business, trust becomes more and more and more important. And so making that the center and insisting for yourself and for anybody you surround yourself with on only playing in the center of the court. Mm. It's another Buffettism because if there's, if you have any doubt about the morality of any decision you're about to make, um, then you shouldn't do it. Don't make it any doubt at all. He says, stick to the center of the playing field. And he also says, because there's plenty of money to be made in the center of the playing field. So, so the, that idea of trust um, animates Berkshire. It's the essence of the Berkshire business model. The, the, the managers at this company are given substantial autonomy. Uh, we, the, the idea is to uh, empower the people closest to the facts to make the decision. So the manager closest to the customer should decide when and how to do a price increase or when and how to do a product rewrite or a product launch, not the CEO of the, of the parent company. <laughs> um, so, um, and, and it is, it's not hard. It's not easy to do that. Mo very many managers like to micromanage it. They, they like to think that they, they know better and they like to intervene and, and call the shots. So it's, there are dozens of companies that follow the Berkshire model, the margin of trust. I think Kelly partners is one constellation software is another. And thanks for mentioning on the board of Constellation as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, I end up I end up on boards where I like the business model and, and both of them and, um, uh, exude this, this idea of trust. Mm. 
I, uh, I, I'm cognizant of the time, um, but there's one final question that I do have for you, which is what I ask to everyone that comes on the show is what's one thing that you believe about investing business or finance or even life itself that few people would agree with you on? It's probably this one we've been discussing. There may be a dozen if I, if I, I, could, I could list them out. I, I think that uh, I, I do um, take some positions that are uh, a little different from the mainstream. And um, I think when they're explained, people nod their heads and agree. But the way the system uh, works, people tend to ignore them in, in practice. And, uh, you know, one, one example is what we've been discussing that um, – having a large organization held together by the glue of trust is just scary to a lot of people. So they would prefer to have um, internal controls that, that channel people's decision-making that limits their scope of, of discretion and, and that promotes in accountability and, and, and make sure that there aren't any unethical behaviors or leakage or accounting irregularities. And my view is that, you'll often get more ethical people and results when you give them power, when you trust them. Uh, I've got a, one of my favorite quotes that's in a few of my books is from a, the CEO of the Berkshire uh, subsidiary Brooks Running Shoe, uh, Jim Weber. And he, he once told me, I have in my long business career, I have never been given so much autonomy and I have never felt more accountable. And so I believe in that. A, a, you know, but I, I think a lot of people wouldn't. A lot of people are too scared to do it. And uh, and it's as I said, I, we we scoured the universe and came up with a few dozen companies that uh, that operate that way. So that that's probably one example. But, but I think you know, if again, if if people actually studied that concept and slowed down on cared slowed down, cared a little bit, I, th I think that at least many of them would be persuaded. Mm. Well, Lawrence, I really appreciate your time today before work hours coming to chat with me and sharing your message with uh, the RAS community, but also the Australian Shareholders Association. Uh, I know you're here with your family and I hope uh, you enjoy the rest of your holiday and uh, you get some, some time with them and, and see some beautiful parts of Australia. Maybe one day you'll even try Melbourne's coffee. I can assure you it is quite good. But uh, once again, thank you, for, thank you for joining me today. Thank you very much, Owen. I look forward to seeing you again.